thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, for anyone watching this video, either now or in the future with visual impairments, I am woman, a Caucasian woman. I have blue eyes, medium length brown hair. I'm wearing a blue lab coat and in the background there's a, a bookcase to my right um, and uh, it's a, a, white, a white wall behind me. Um, during the presentation, you can ask questions in the chat and I will be monitoring that for questions for Kate later. Um, if you wish for the questions to come to me or Kate privately, you can choose to send a private message within the chat or you can also email me um, Sue Donovan at virginia.edu. So um, I'd like to start the presentation with a few acknowledgements. Um, I want to acknowledge the Monica Nation, the traditional owners of the land and waters from which I'm speaking to you today. You can learn more about and support the history and traditions of the Monica Nation at monacanation.com. I also want to honor the lives and work of the enslaved laborers who built the University of Virginia, uh, where I'm speaking to you today. The website slavery.virginia.edu explores the impact and history of enslaved workers at the University of Virginia. We are also in the middle of a global pandemic, which is why we are providing this presentation in a virtual format. Finally, the killings of Black Americans, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Michael Brown, Lano Castile, Laquan McDonald, Eric Gardner, and so many others have caused racial justice protests across the United States and the world. I want to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter and that as a white woman with inherent privilege, I have a lot of work to do. The latest protests against racial injustice stirred by the killing of George Floyd by police have consolidated around the removal of monuments to the Confederate cause. Kate Ridgway, State Archaeological Conservator at the Department of Historic Resources in Richmond, Virginia, will be speaking to us today about her experiences with the planned removal of the Robert E. Lee Monument on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. Kate will share her screen to show her presentation, and um, after that, after the presentation, we'll do a couple minutes of Q&A. So please type your questions in the chat window, and I will monitor that. Um, and just know that this presentation will be recorded um, and so we'll try to have that recording available as soon as possible. So Kate, if you want to get started. Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm going to close that box. There we go. <clears throat> uh, my name is Kate Ridgway. I am the State Archaeological Conservator for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Um, first, I would just like to point out that my title is State archaeological conservator, uh, which just speaks to the fact that when it comes to monuments, many people are being brought in to do this work and not necessarily um, everyone has a ton of experience with monuments. And so many people um, in preservation and conservation are being asked to do work that is not necessarily their forte, although most of us have a general background. Uh, that gives us enough information to be helpful. Um, so if you're feeling like you're um, being asked to do something that's a little bit out of your um, normal understanding, then you, I just like to point out that you are not alone. Um, so I've given lectures about Monument Avenue before. And normally when I do this, I give a little bit of uh, historical background. Uh, but for this group, I feel like the historic background is something you're probably already pretty familiar with um, between being a group of preservationists and being a group who is probably very um, aware of all of the the history that's going on right now. And so I'm going to go through a little bit of the history of the monuments, but it's going to be pretty quick. Um, if you need more information about that, I'm sure you um, know where you can find more information. Um, there's a lot of it out there at this point. So normally I would start with talking about uh, the Lee Monument and this idea that there was um, a reaction about the Lee Monument being erected in the white community and a reaction in the African-American community and that 
even before the monument went up, it was controversial. So the entire history of this monument has been surrounded by controversy. It um, flares up every now and then, but it is sort of um, a perpetual thing that has happened with Lee. Then I usually talk about the Lost Cause, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, I think all of you are probably very aware of that part of the history um, and, and how that has um, really steered what these actual monuments mean. Uh, the role these monuments had to play during Reconstruction, uh, Jim Crow, segregation, uh, the civil rights movement, um, and this idea that the, the monuments have, have always been there to be um, a player in, in this kind of conversation. And then uh, because uh, many of you are probably in Charlottesville, you may have even been there when the tragedy happened in Charlottesville in 2017. Um, and that, un until recently, that was the last um, time that the monuments were um, a real focus. And at that time, many monuments were actually removed. Um, and now the, as, as it always happens, there's a sort of an ebb and tide of the monuments becoming controversial and that controversy sort of, um, dying down a little and then coming back. And so now um, it seems there's there's uh, this final push to actually make some kind of change when it comes to these monuments. So we've started to see monuments actually, like a real true effort to remove these monuments in a way that hasn't happened before. So <clears throat> we have the current, um, the current movement, which started with George Floyd, which everyone is aware of, and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, there are a series of, of excellent pictures um, that are projected on the monument by an artist called Dustin Klein. Uh, the ones you see in my lecture, I got from an article by My Modern Met. So if you want to see more of that artwork, you can go to the My Modern Met article and, and see them. I've just picked a few that I thought were particularly excellent. So um, so what I actually want to talk about are the preservation aspects. Um, so <clears throat> I usually use this quote um, that discusses how the meaning of public sculpture changes over time and how a society views sculpture changes over time. But in reality, that's not quite right with the Confederate monuments. They've always been infused with a very specific meaning. In this case, that meaning hasn't changed so much as the um, willingness of society to put up with that meaning has changed. Um, and so you're seeing things happening to these monuments that previously would have been considered um, vandalism such as graffiti and damage and things like that, where in preservation, it would have been something that we would have wanted to undo, is now part of a historic movement. And it, it's causing a shift in the understanding of the preservation of these monuments where now things that would have been removed the next day are things that are now contributing to that history and are being preserved, which is a, a different way of thinking for preservationists and conservators. And so it's been, um, because of everything that's been going on around the monuments, it's been a feeling at DHR for a while that we were wanting to come up with new guidance um, because this idea that previously, if someone uh, tagged a monument, it would be perfectly um, understandable for a group to remove that graffiti. Now that graffiti has taken on a historic importance that it didn't have before. So we wanted to, to give people some guidance because these monuments are being damaged, um, being pulled down, and, and all of these things are happening. And, and in some ways, it's damage that isn't something, it's a different type of, it's a different way of thinking about preservation. So, <clears throat> the Department of Historic Resources came up with this guidance document about monuments. And you can find this on our website. Uh, and the idea is that 
this document will help people understand several aspects of what's going on. So first, it has some information about the legal aspects of the monuments and their removal or damage, some information about uh, the historic importance of monuments and how that might, the removal of those monuments might change the historic nature of a landscape, such as Monument Avenue having all of its monuments removed, will certainly affect it's standing on something like the National Register. So giving localities the ability to have this guidance. And then there's also a section on preservation. So the idea that some of this damage is historically important now, so it's not necessarily um, in the best in interest of historic preservation to remove them. Um, we draw the line when it comes to public safety. So of course, if a monument has been damaged to the extent that there's a public safety issue, we don't want that to continue. But if there's graffiti and other things that are an important part of the history of this object now, then we need to recognize that that's important and there needs to be some guidance on how that um, social change in the monument has to be preserved. So we've created these monument um, guidelines just to give people a place to come and look and see how things are changing and to give people information on how to contact someone to help them work through because there's no there's no way anybody can pretend like every monument is the same so if your locality's monument has some specific issue that's something where um, at least now they can hopefully have some feeling that they have somebody to contact to sort of work through the nitty-gritty of what needs to happen with the monument. And there's other monuments that, like AP Hill, where there's human remains buried there, and that also adds another layer of um, difficulty in trying to figure out what the future of that monument is going to be. So we tried to create these, these monument guidelines just to sort of help the Commonwealth of Virginia, all the different localities that are dealing with this. <clears throat> One of the goals of this guidance document was to prevent uh, damage and uh, public safety issues. So um, here you see a Jefferson Davis being removed from New Orleans uh, shortly after um, the events in Charlottesville. And so he was, he was rigged in the middle of the night and moved. And um, there's some concern that if this sort of um, removal process continues, that this ends up being a public safety issue. They're, they're trying to solve one public safety issue, which is having crowds around, um, but then also running into another public safety issue. So trying to figure out ways to help people um, move these safely, both for the monument and for the public and for the crews who are doing this. So the other picture here is just um, a, an, an image to show the kinds of damage that we're trying to help localities avoid. Um, in this case, this was a Confederate monument in Virginia that was removed, and um, it was removed by helicopter in the middle of the night, and you can see that the method of removal was not ideal and has left um, quite a bit of damage on the landscape. So the hope is that these guidance documents will help people to um, make decisions that are safe for the monument and for the public and for the work crews, and if they don't feel like they can figure that out on their own, they have a place to come and ask their questions. So another goal of this guidance document is to help localities um, come up with a plan for the the whole monument. Um, and this, I mean, this is pretty evident on Monument Avenue where the most offensive part is the statue and that comes off of its plinth, but then you have these giant uh, granite or whatever they're made out of, these giant pedestals that are still remaining. And so this idea that there should be a whole plan that uh, is an understanding of the community of the development of the entire place. So once you remove the statue, are you then going to remove the pedestal and the base? Um, are you leaving the pedestal there so that uh, the community can decide on some other form of public art that goes there. Um, but something to help communities spur this conversation and understand that once the monuments removed, there's still work to be done. You have to make a plan to, to, to 
figure out what you're going to do with the entire thing. Is it okay for the pedestal to stay with no monument on it? Is that the, is that the message that you're trying to send, which is totally fine. You just, it, it, it needs to be a conversation of how is this going to be seen through to the end? What is happening to this monument? Um, is it just going to be staying in storage forever? Is the monument being given to another community or museum or whoever? Um, just trying to make sure people understand that once you've removed the monument, that's not, the job isn't done. You have to understand the process as a whole. So, before I get to specifics about the Lee Monument, one of the things that has come up is that as a conservator, and I suspect this is the same issue with a lot of preservationists in general, the process can be really frustrating. Um, it feels like there's a lot of sudden decision making because this wasn't something that anyone was necessarily planning on doing in 2020 and there's been a lot going on in 2020 and so working with these communities that are already um dealing with covid and the sort of upheavals that that's had um on their communities and then to now have to try and figure out what they're going to be doing with this monuments it feels very um unplanned and it can be really um, stressful for people who work in preservation who really like plans. And it also feels as though these projects are being done with limited planning and limited funding, which to some extent is very true. Um, if there was a plan to remove these monuments two years from now and the budget hasn't been set yet or that budget was eaten up because of COVID or whatever, um, it can be true that there's limited time to plan and limited funding to move these monuments. And it's something that in a lot of ways, the preservation people have to just be okay, um, have to figure out a way to work with the communities within their resources um, because there's not, there's only so much control anyone has over this process. Um, it's a group process and the preservation folks have to be a part of that group. Another issue that's been coming up frequently is there's no, the definition of what these contested and problematic monuments is, that definition is still pretty nebulous. Uh, the idea that the Confederate monuments, especially the ones that were put up as part of the lost cause, that's a pretty clear definition of a monument that needs to be removed, but then there's other monuments that now that this conversation has become so large and so national, what other monuments are needing to be removed? Why do these monuments need to be removed? Are decisions being made too suddenly? And so this, um, again, can be, can feel very unsettling to people who work in preservation who aren't necessarily, um, they're preserving history and um, this idea that history is changing so quickly and right in front of them. It's exciting to be a part of that history, but for a lot of preservation people and conservators, um, it can be really unsettling to be a part of that process. Um, another thing that I, I, as a conservator, and I assume a lot of people who work in conservation and preservation are not excited when they have to react to things instead of being able to know about a process and and be a part of that process um if you're just being asked to like oh by the way we're, this this is a thing we're doing now come and help um it can be really frustrating to be asked to do that but again there's sometimes just not a lot of op options for the conservator <clears throat> another thing that's been happening in these processes is it can be really hard to get contractors. Um, in the state of Virginia and in the South, I would um, guess, there's a lot of people who don't wanna have their name associated with dealing with these monuments. They feel that it will negatively impact their business and that makes a lot of sense. So there are conservators who, so as a conservator who works for the state, I have a certain amount of protection from that because my livelihood is not based on whether or not people think that I've done the right or the wrong thing, however their feelings lie. 
that doesn't affect my ability to be employed in a way. Uh, but for people who have private businesses, their reputation can be really affected by the types of projects they pick. And so being a part of a project where you're doing something like removing Robert E. Lee from Monument Avenue can be really um, scary and make people feel like they can't be a part of it. Um, they'd rather just not have to, to deal with the possible repercussions. So in a way, some of the processes have become more expensive because we can't find local contractors who will want to help with various parts of the project. So it's another thing that has to be kept in mind when you're talking about budgets is that if you have to go all the way to New England to get somebody, you're adding a lot of cost to getting the project done. And then for people who work in state government anyway, um, and, and any kind of government really, there's this um, idea that the Freedom of Information Act is probably going to happen. Ha having somebody FOIA you is probably going to happen. Um, so it feels a lot more stressful to even write emails or have conversations with people because you know that there's a chance that somebody is going to want to read all of your emails about this process. And so we want people to be very aware of what's going on with the monument process. We're not worried about them reading it. It just does feel like you have to think more about emails that normally you would consider fairly private. You're just trying to get a project done. You're thinking about it more in a, if the public reads this, how are they going to interpret it? When you, as a professional, understand what you're talking about, but then the public may not understand it quite as well. So having this, like, you're writing these emails in a particular way just to make sure that if and when they become public knowledge, it will be um, something that the public can sort of uh, have a better understanding of. So let's talk a little bit about Lee in particular. I love this diagram from Style Weekly. It sort of gives you a sense of um, the size difference between some of these. So if any of you saw Lee or Stonewall Jackson coming down, um, you can see how Lee is not only bigger, but harder to access. He's much higher up. And so there's certain issues with Lee that are even more difficult um, than when Stonewall Jackson came down. And so the other thing to understand is that Lee is the only monument that is under the state responsibility. The rest of the monuments on Monument Avenue um, are under the city's responsibility. And so um, when the new laws got in place on July 1st, the city decided to move all of their monuments, but there have been different um, legal um, actions going on with Lee that have caused him to be staying in place while there's some judgments that are that are made. So I'll be talking about what we've been doing to prepare for if Lee moves, but he hasn't moved yet and it is still not certain he will move at all. So the beginning of this process, um, for me and my involvement was reading in the newspaper that Governor Northam was like, we need to move Lee as soon as possible. And so at the time I read that and I read that um, the General Services Administration was gonna be the one responsible for moving it, which is a different agency than the one I'm in. I um, called my boss because I had some concerns and I just thought the GSA is really great with what they do, uh, but our job is preservation and, and we do that all the time. And so while moving the monument may be something that they do a lot of, we deal with preservation and we should have sort of a seat at that table to just help be advisors uh, because part of our role is to preserve um, Virginia history. And so I called um, so my boss is Elizabeth Moore. She's the state archaeologist. And I just had a conversation with her saying I was hoping that we could have one of our preservation folks uh, be a part of that conversation. And so um, thankfully, she agreed with me and called our director. And I think I, our director was probably already um, considering this anyway. 
and so it wasn't so much that I was approached to be a part of it, but I sort of stuck my oar in, which I'm, for those who know me, that's not terribly surprising. So after that, our director just worked out a way to have an agreement with GSA. So we worked on having, on creating a preservation agreement with them, which is just a document of sort of understanding between us and the GSA to say, when Lee is moved, there are certain preservation aspects of that movement that need to happen. And that while Lee is being stored, there are certain preservation things that need to happen until Lee has his permanent new home, wherever that is. So we, I helped create that document, um, mostly the preservation aspects on how it was moved and things like that. And then I um, was allowed to review the treatment or the, the the proposal from the conservators who were ultimately given the contract. I, I got to read their proposal on how to, how they were going to move Lee and just send my comments in uh, just to see how they were going to do it, that it was going to be done safely, that it, both for the monument, but also for the, the crew and the public. And so, um, I was sort of, I'm sort of a peripheral part of that process. And then, uh, so part of this is that in this proposal, it says that Lee is gonna be separated into parts. And so this picture sort of shows Lee coming into town in different sections. Um, and this idea that Lee comes apart is something that, and that any of these monumental statues come into pieces um, is something that, I think the public struggles to realize. I think they see them as these giant monolithic things and they don't realize that they're sectional. So when I'm reading this proposal and the the conservators are talking about how they might have to cut him into different sections because while he went together easily, it's been over a hundred years. And so now he's corroded together in some places and there've been, preservation um, things that have gone on with him over the, the decades. And so he doesn't necessarily come apart as easily as he went together. And so we were reviewing, reviewing this document and to somebody who works in preservation, you're like, okay, that makes sense. Like there's a certain amount of corrosion. You might have to use some tools to get him apart. Um, he's so gigantic that he has to come down in sections because to transport him, he's something like 21 feet tall and weighs 13 tons. And so to transport him to the location he's going to be stored at temporarily, is it's not a thing that can be done with him in one piece. Um, not safely, not safely for the monument, not safe, safely for the road systems and not safely for people. So reading this as somebody working in preservation, it seems completely logical and normal. Um, then there was, um, this information made it to the press. And so this is where I had a, I had a moment where I'm reading these, these headlines and I'm thinking, oh, the visual of people thinking, oh my gosh, we're cutting up Lee. All I could think was we're, oh, there's going to be riots. Um, so this idea that the press is sort of going for the dramatic headline, which they have to sell papers. I understand what their role is. Um, it's just a little frustrating because we aren't, we don't want to, we don't want to make the public nervous because it sound, this headline makes it sound like we are destroying Lee and destroying the Lee Monument. And as a preservation group, that's not at all what we're doing and not at all the image that we want to project. And so, when I first saw this, I was really frustrated, um, but it actually turned out okay. Um, and so this is the kind of headline I would have preferred um, from this uh, article from a, a newspaper in Maine. Um, what it actually ended up doing was giving people, giving, giving people some time to, um, come to terms with this idea that Lee comes into pieces and also give us a chance as preservationists to 
explain to the public what that means and that this that even though he will be separated into pieces this is actually a part of the preservation process that it would actually be more dangerous for the monument and for people to leave him in one piece and try and move him that way it's just not um, feasible uh, so this idea of him coming apart is actually i think m starting to be more well understood by the public so it ended up being a, a good thing in the end um, to have this information out in the public so i am going to end up being on site when lee is disassembled for a couple reasons um one is so that we can, as DHR, can have somebody there to just watch the process because we're fairly certain we're going to get questions from the public about how it worked and what happened and, and how the process went and things like that. Um, and so having somebody from DHR there to sort of observe and write a report and have that available for people on staff so that when the public calls we can answer it is going to be very helpful. The second reason and where me being an archaeological conservator comes in handy is that, and, and there's no confirmation, but there may be a time capsule somewhere under Lee. And so this is a picture of the time capsule that was found under the Lee in North Carolina. Uh, and the, the understanding is that the time capsule under our Lee would be pretty similar. So it's a copper alloy box that's relatively large. And um, so time capsules in people's heads are like you know hermetically sealed and in great shape and whatever but in reality most of the time they end up coming out of the cornerstone or monument or whatever in pretty bad shape and so they end up being more like an archaeological object than a museum object and so having an archaeological conservator there on site to disassemble this um, time capsule and get it back to the lab and stabilize it is actually really helpful so we don't know if there's a time capsule there, but if there is, it will be um, easier for me to, to preserve if I'm there on site and can take it to the lab immediately. So just to give you a sense of some of the side effects of working on monuments that have happened. Um, first of all, you're working on monuments during COVID-19. So there's that extra factor of a pandemic. Um, the public starts to assume that they know your political and social beliefs because of the work that you're doing. Um, even though you are doing your job, they feel like that the results of your job have a reflection on you as a, as a person and your beliefs. Because of some of this work, you can end up being a target of hate crimes. Um, there have been moments where photographs have been taken of people doing this kind of work um, so that they or their work can be targeted later. Um, there is always a risk when you're working in the middle of civil unrest. And while um, there may not be civil unrest at every location for a monument, for Lee, that is definitely a concern. There's a certain amount of, of stress that goes along with this, which I'm sure is self-explanatory. Uh, your schedule is unpredictable. Um, there's a very real need for mental care. Uh, a lot of times just so you can avoid being burnt out. You're being asked to do a lot of work on an unpredictable schedule with that sometimes outside your what you would consider your normal job, um, depending on what it is you do. For me, this is definitely outside my normal my normal work. Um, but I work for the state, and so it, in a way, it's not outside my normal work. It's just unusual for me to have to deal with a monument. Um, and in a way, you're working in a, in a, you're in a position where you may be doing things that seem um, like not what you got into preservation for. Uh, so disassembling a monument may feel to you, depending on your personal feelings, like you're doing something that's not a preservation activity. And so it can be really tiring to do this work. And so you can end up getting kind of burned out and wondering why you got into preservation. And then another side effect is you, you end up asking to, the people want you to be on a committee for this, that, or the other thing, um, or 
are asking you to give lectures because there are only so many of these monuments and there's only so many people working on them and people are very interested in them and it's it's a good side effect it's just um, another thing that happens when you start having to work on these monuments um, so you really do have to make sure that you're going to take care of yourself if you're working on a monument like this I have found it helpful to have sort of a go bag, which is really like a go Hollinger box um, where I have PPE in case of COVID. I have everything I need to take care of a monument. Uh, and then I have everything I need prepared. I have different shoes. I have uh, sunscreen. I have all sorts of stuff in this box. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I also have uh, protein bars and things like that because you don't know how long you're going to end up out there. So having this go box kind of gives me a sense of relief because I know I don't have to run around if something unexpected happens. I also, when working on these things, it's really important to be clear to people that you're doing a job um, and that whatever it is, whatever reason they approached you to talk to you about this, that you're working with them to help them deal with whatever it is. You're not a psychiatrist, it's not your job, but on some level you have to have some compassion and try and help them resolve what's going on because you have a understanding sometimes that the public doesn't have about why things are moving. Um, but it's also important to stay neutral. You need to understand that, and, and especially in my position where I'm working as a state employee, I work for everyone in the Commonwealth, and that's a lot of people with a, do a lot of different opinions about what is going on. And so when everything, when Lee is moved and done, or when Lee is decided to be, they decide to keep him there, people in the Commonwealth still have to feel comfortable trusting me with their history and trusting me to do my job. And so if I become too polarized one way or the other, I can't do my job anymore. So it can be really difficult to, to try and walk that line of neutrality. And it's not necessarily, I don't know if it's necessary for everyone to, but for my personal feelings are that neutrality becomes very important um, in this process. Um, I would recommend that you try and protect yourself from being identified if you think you're in a situation where that could be a problem, where you might be the target of a hate crime. So I've taken, so COVID actually helps out a lot with this, where you're wearing a mask, I wear sunglasses, I'll put on, um, I wear nondescript clothing that doesn't have logos on it. I will take um, a state vehicle and not my personal vehicle. Um, I just do different things to sort of protect myself. It sounds a little paranoid, but um, I've seen enough and heard enough about what's going on to know that I'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, make sure that when, if you're a part of one of these plans, make sure that there's a plan for keeping the crew safe. If you so with Robert E. Lee, there's definitely a plan in place where there's going to be um, law enforcement officers and security just to make sure that, because we know the public is going to be very interested in what's going on, and we just want to make sure that interest stays as interest and not become something else. And so having um, security there so that the crew can feel safe enough to just concentrate on their job, um, because it's it's hard enough moving some monument like this without having to wonder, like having to watch your back. So if you feel like that you're dealing with a monument where that's an issue, make sure you're considering security. And take time to take care of yourself. If you're involved in one of the moving a monument, it takes a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of planning. And so, and in a way you've sort of been dealing with monuments for a while probably before you had to become involved in moving one. And so plan some kind of activity that has nothing to do with monuments. Um, do something that can reduce your stress and help you prevent getting burnt out. I garden, I watch bad movies. Um, I do things with my friends. Like I try and do stuff that helps to get me out of that, um, that mindset. So I'd like to just thank a few people because this is not a process you get through by yourself. So um, Julie Lang and Elizabeth Moore, who are my bosses, um, have done a lot to make sure that preservation is at the table for the moving of Lee, which is greatly appreciated. Um, I think it's really important. It's really important to what DHR does. Um, I need to thank my colleagues because there's been a lot of venting during this process. Um, and so I appreciate that they've had to listen to me vent about this. 
Um, and my friends and family have had to listen to me vent about this. So I'm, I thank them. And I thank my therapist for having to listen to me. There's a lot of people who have to just listen to me talk about this because it's the only way I can, I can, um, get some things out of my system and then be able to prevent, present a professional face to the public when I have to talk to them about monuments. So, um, I clearly did not cover everything um, because there's no way to do that in, you know, an hour. But I wanted to give you guys a chance to ask me questions. I'm happy to stay um, for as long as I'm allowed. Um, I'm also putting my contact information up there. Um, remember, there's no E in Ridgeway, which is the most common reason for my email getting bounced back. But I feel like there's probably some questions that people may have that um, either they feel like will take too long to answer during this or are um, something that they don't really want everyone to hear um, because there are a lot of issues that come up with these monuments. So if you feel like you need to contact me after this, please feel free. I'm a resource for anybody in the, in the Commonwealth and I'm happy to talk to people about I'm happy to talk to people about monuments. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, I think I'm gonna be able to take questions now. Let's see how this. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see any in the chat right now. Um, thanks, Kate. Thank you so I much. Was, I was so good. There's no questions. That's oh, amazing. <laughs> I, I see one from Crystal. Um, oh, good. She says, regarding the press, has your department been able to create press releases to explain proactively how the department is removing particular statues? So yeah, we have a public information officer. And so he's responsible for making sure that there are press briefs and things like that. Um, so when we do have questions, and we have a Facebook page where we do put a lot of things to help people understand these processes, but we're um, in this process anyway with Lee, we're sort of more of an advisory group. And so we answer questions when we can about um, preservation, but a lot of these questions end up going through GSA because they're actually sort of in charge of the process and they have their own press people dealing with it as well. So yeah, so we, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, so we, we do have that. Yeah, that's been a, that's been part of this. Yep. Um, Will Rourke uh, wants to know if the DHR was able to obtain a 3D data set for the Lee Monument? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, so the, okay. So we attempted to get a 3D scan of Lee and there were technical issues. So we do not have that. It was something we tried and um, I don't know that we've been able to get set up for uh, trying that again. Um, I do think other folks have done 3D scans, but as far as DHR is concerned, we, we did try and there were technical issues and so the scan failed. Um, but it, it, we, it was considered because I think that's a really good idea for a lot of these monuments that are being moved. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was just curious, like how hard it was to find the contractors to help with moving our, our, and as a tangential question, are we seeing these companies that are now going to be specializing um, in removal of monuments? Well, I, I, well, first of all, I think there are companies that specialize in monuments and they're becoming specialists in removing them. Um, and so when I sort of inserted myself into this, I gave names to my director to give to the GSA of, of groups that were conservators who I thought would be really good at this. And a lot of them end up being um, people who are previously involved either with monuments or with cemeteries uh, because cemeteries are so monument heavy. And so um, having, but, I, but I, I sent them names with the caveat that some people may, I sent them many names just because I thought that there was a chance that people would not be interested, especially if they were in private practice. Um, so it, ha it has been um, difficult. The, the conservators that were ultimately chosen are from uh, Pennsylvania. They've had to get um, equipment from, I think, as far as Connecticut. Uh, so um, there have been some difficulties. Um, the nice thing is that a lot of the people involved with this process are state employees. So you're a state employee, so you do your job. Um, but for the specialized contractors, I think there has been a little bit of difficulty, yeah.
-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the, there's a man at an elk garden. Um, it is a, let me see if I can find, find it. Um, Ellenwood or the, there's a, me, a small museum. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I can't find it right now, but he has offered to um, accept all of the statues. I do. Here. I do think I know who you're talking about. Um, so I, to some extent, a lot of those uh, people who've offered to take monuments are working with the city of Richmond and not with us. Um, my understanding is that right now the city of Richmond is accepting applications for people to um, take the monuments and uh, there are certain um, requirements I think for taking these monuments and so I'm not sure that there's a plan yet for what's going on with Lee which would be the only one the state has any control over but I know that there have been several places that have said that they would take all of them uh, and I think that there's um, some concerns about having all of them in one place mm -hmm. um, so and there and there are quite a few people who have um, interest. I think there was a there was an article about the Valentine taking um, Jefferson Davis because a Valentine sculpted Jefferson Davis, and they have the original um, artist's studio, and so there's a way that they can tell the sort of circular story of that monument in a way that not there's no other localities that can do it. So I think they're trying to um, consider what the best disposition is, but that that would be a question for the city really yeah yeah um i see a question from garth anderson um at the jeff davis statue leaving the foundation behind mm -hmm. who defines that it wasn't part of the monument um so i'm not sure there's any definition that it wasn't part of the monument i think that um there's a lot going on with making a decision about removing a statue because it's the most um, polarizing part of it and then figuring out how to deal with it because um, I'm sorry he said Jeff Davis the, yeah. the really big one with all the columns um, I think that in some ways they're probably and this is again uh, this is all based on the city of Richmond they're probably facing and this is a guess but they're probably facing um, some economic questions as well um, where um, getting riggers to come and move a statue is one thing. Having um, giant stone monolithic plinths and columns and things moved is um, sort of on a whole nother level logistically and, and economically. So um, I'm not sure they're done. I, I don't know if anybody has said that they're done moving things. So there's a chance I think that more will be removed at some point or there maybe is a discussion as to reusing that space. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then um, Lauren Work is asking about your thoughts around some of the repainting that has already gone on with some of the monuments, and she's particularly thinking of Stonewall. Stonewall Jackson, yeah. Um, and she, she's wondering if you're involved in any of this or potentially in future decision making about whether to preserve the new paint or remove it. Okay, so the, the repainting of the Stonewall Jackson monument was not done with the permission of anybody. My understanding was it was a private group or individual who went and repainted it um, without necessarily permission because they even painted the bricks and, and things that it, it was it's was odd um, and it's already being spray painted uh, graffitied over. Um, so my understanding is it wasn't with anybody's permission that it was painted over. DHR is recommending that um, graffiti for this particular case be preserved or recorded at least before it's removed or painted over just so that the understanding of the importance in history is preserved. Um, but Richmond has is deciding what Richmond City wants. And so as the state government, we've um, been advocating to not remove that graffiti. Um, to make sure that the Lee Monument anyway, I mean, and it's layers and layers of graffiti at this point. And so um, my understanding is that the city never made a call and that what, what's been going on currently has been private people doing it. Um, 
So yeah, I'm not sure how Richmond feels about it, but the state wants the state wants the graffiti to stay because it's important at this point. It's not some random person tagging a, a monument. It's a social movement. So yeah. You're getting a lot of thanks and remarks on the great presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad it was I'm glad it was helpful and hopefully interesting. Um, it's a complicated and difficult topic and I, I feel for anyone who has to um, wade into these waters. It's not the easiest thing ever. So the new signs, I saw that I, I see I see a comment popping up about the new signs. I, I assume this is the signs that were um, trying to mimic the uh, historic marker signs, uh, the highway markers. Um, DHR does not have anything to do with those signs. Um, there's been some articles about it. They are, as far as I'm aware, they're not supposed to be there. Um, the historic highway marker signs that come out of our office are all, um, there's huge conversations about, um, you know, everything, where they get put, what's on there, um, how they're going to be funded and things like that. And so we have a whole um, group of people here who work with communities to have those highway markers put up. And so I think that if the highway markers um, have information, the ones that have been popping up have information that's um, important and historically interesting, if they wanted to work with our office, I'm sure we'd be happy to work with them. Um, but we're, I don't know if, um, I think there was a group that took credit for them popping up and I'm not remembering it at the time. Um, so my understanding is that they've been popping up and then being taken down by the police. Um, so it's not something that our office has anything to do with. So D. Um, Will asked a question earlier about whether DHR might have a, a role in recontextualizing the Lee statue if it does stay up. Um, I would be surprised if we didn't. Um, it makes a lot of sense for us to be involved with that just because we're involved with all the National Register aspects of it and things like that. So um, I would I would guess that we would be involved with that um, and, and what that recontextualizing looks like and things like that. But I think that's also something where it's going to end up being a bigger community conversation um, about how that space gets used. Um, but I don't know that we're, since we don't know what's really happening yet because of the injunction and the, the court hearing that's gonna happen in October, um, I think that we'd be happy to be a part of it and we probably will, yeah. Do you have um, thoughts about live streaming, of removal of monuments and uh. what are yeah <laughs> <laughs> i okay so it, it's not just monuments it's always a little um i always feel a little uncomfortable when i'm doing anything that could be um have something horrible happen like i'm um, trying to deal like even if i'm doing conservation work in the lab and it's and it's uh, a fussy and an object could be harmed it just seems um to put an extra strain on the person doing it that it's already a difficult process. Um, I think as a, as a person who does this kind of work, I would not want to do that, but I don't know that it's something that shouldn't happen. Um, I think that there's a risk there, depending on how people feel about what's going on. Um, mostly I would defer to people who are more involved with public safety because I think that's where the real issues come in is if that there's a live event and it causes more people to be physically there, um, that there's concerns that the crew won't be able to safely do their job without something happening to the crowd or to themselves um, and that they'll be more restricted. So I think for certain monuments, you might be able to do that. But with Robert E. Lee, I think there's so much going on with him and he's so gigantic that it could be it could be difficult. I was at um, when Stonewall Jackson came down. I was there, and there were like six drones um, flying around all of these people, um, and I don't know if they were. And, and that's part of the thing with the drones. You don't know if it's from a news agency or if it's from 
someone private. And I had two thoughts. I had one thought about the crews being distracted by something flying in their face because some of them got really close to the folks who were doing it. And the second one I thought, if these are live streaming to somebody's account, social media account, it's one of those things about the safety of the crew being identified, depending on who the group watching the video is, are they being, are they identifying someone that they are, um, if it's a group that's very angry about the monument removal, I wouldn't want my face on a live stream social media necessarily. I'd feel, I'd feel personally unsafe having that happen. And so um, things like drones, I would really not think would be um, acceptable just because they can be so distracting. Um, having a, a news crew there, I think that might be okay. Um, but I, I do, I would defer to whatever a public safety officer felt about that in reality. I personally would not want to do anything about the Lee removal on television just because if anything went wrong, it would just not be good. If you saw, and I don't, I absolutely do not recommend anyone go see this video, but the videos of what happened in Portsmouth where the, um, the monument fell on someone, that's the, that's my fear is that something goes wrong and someone gets hurt and now it's on television mm -hmm. um, because that, that video is, horrifying and I wish I hadn't seen it um so I am of two minds I think it's important to document a historic events I think it's a little terrifying to be documented doing a historical event yeah <laughs> so yeah. um yeah it's a hard question to answer for sure yeah yeah it's like we got one last question about whether you know when DHR might release guidance on contextualization uh, I think that we have to first know whether or not Lee is even staying. So my guess is um, when the, so the, the court hearings start in October, I want to say the beginning of October. Um, and so I don't think anyone knows really how long that's going to take. And so once there's a decision there, if it's, if it's Lee moving, then they won't even discuss contextualization, which makes sense. Um, it'll be more of a discussion of who is going to ultimately be the owner of Lee, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be a different conversation that I am guessing DHR will also be involved in. Um, and then, so it won't, my guess, um, be even discussed until it's known that Lee is gonna stay. So mm -hmm. who knows? I think the earliest it would be, would be closer to the end of the year, but um, I'm sure that guidance will be um, made public. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. statewide contextualization. So, oh, I see. So a document to help localities figure out ways to contextualize their monuments is, ah, okay. I got it right. Okay. So, um, you know, that's a really good question. I am trying to remember if it's in our, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in our guidance document now. I will have to look. If it's not in our guidance document now, I will definitely recommend that because I think that is something that um, DHR might be able to help with. So that's a, that's a good idea. If it's not already out there, I will ask. Yep. All right, well, we're at one o'clock. So Kate, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for coming and attending this um, virtual preservation, preserve on grounds brown bag. Um, we, we have recorded this, so we're gonna do, we're gonna get it to you as soon as we can. Um, and yeah, just thanks everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe for um, sure. Yeah, Kate, you wanna stay on a little bit? Yeah, I can stay on. Yep. All right, all right, thanks everyone. Bye.